we have its Chief Master Sergeant Alan Usry, and he's a retired command senior enlisted leader for North American Aerospace Defense Command and United States Northern Command from Peterson Air Force Base. He also served as a principal advisor to the commander on all enlisted matters. Um, he also currently serves as the board of directors for the Air Force Enlisted Village as a military relations consultant for Pioneer Services, a division of Mid-Country Bank. He's also been a guest columnist with Fox News, The Hill, and The Virginia Pilot. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome retired Chief Master Sergeant W. Allen Usry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Hey, ooh, boy, now that is loud. Once again, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. So, as he said, I, and it's on the slide, uh, I'm Alan Essery, retired command chief out at NORAD Northcom, retired about eight years ago for what, for what that's worth. But, I, you know, I share in your excitement at this moment because I know when you looked at the agenda and you saw financial resiliency, you stopped everything you were doing, you contacted your family, and you said, this, this is why I became a chief. You know? And as you know, this is the first time we've done this combined. For the last six years, I've gone out and done this brief with individual MAGCOMs, but I couldn't hit them all. I would hit three or four. Now, I'm not saying the Air Force consolidated this just so you could all get my briefing, but the evidence is pretty self-evident. And, you know, and they put me first. I, I wasn't first, and then they thought about it, and I'm sure they said, you know what? Nobody's going to be able to pay attention to anything until they get the briefing they really want. So, so now that I have set the appropriate level of expectations, let's get on with this. Take a look at that up on the screen. <laughs> I, saw, I saw this on Facebook, I don't know, it was probably two or three years ago. And everybody thought it was pretty funny, but with anything, it's funny. Why? Because there's an element of truth to it. And it stood out to me because it had two things on there. It had relationships and money, and both of those things are, are kind of intertwined. We'll touch on that in a minute. Let me go ahead and tell you what it is we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about, very briefly, what is financial resiliency, why it's important, and then we're going to get into, I'm going to provide you a little bit of background over uh, finances and the military from a kind of a strategic level. Uh, over the last 15 years or so, but I'm hitting a hit on the Military Lending Act. Uh, I don't include the, or I'm not including the, like, the Servicemen's Civil Relief Act in there because I think most of you are familiar with that. Most of you may not be familiar with the Military Lending Act, and that's the protections that we have out there for service members. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to spend most of my time probably on the next two slides on considerations for leaders and more to know, and then I'm going to do a fun little exercise on compounding interest. It's something that really stood out to me way back in the day when I first saw it, so I'll share that with you. But I promise you this, I will give you some information you probably haven't had out of one of these briefings before. I will try to be as upbeat and entertaining as I can be. If you snore, I will wake you up. Got it? All right. So let's start. I mean, we all know what resiliency is. It's really the ability to withstand what life throws at you and keep moving forward with a certain level uh, of, of stress that's appropriate, not letting it, it overwhelm you. Um, but why is it really important? Do we really see financial readiness as a mission essential thing? And the one thing I always point out, especially for leaders, is you have to remember that this is the number one reason that members lose their security clearance, and more importantly, it's the second leading contributing factor in service member suicide. What do you think the number one factor is? Relationships, absolutely. And those two factors are so intertwined at times that you really can't separate them. And that goes back to that slide that I was showing you. They, the relationships and the money impact each other. Let's move on. Let me give you a little bit of background and, and frame the problem here. In 2001, Navy and Marine Corps Relief gave a total of $5,000 to nine service members who had been the victims of predatory lenders. $5,000, nine members. 
Just five years later, in 2006, that amount had gone up to 1.37 million. So around that 2006 time, there was a lot of discussion on Capitol Hill about why this had become such a problem. There was a lot of discussion in DOD. I was a numbered Air Force Command Chief at the time, and I remember this is where it really you started having a lot of conversations about those outside the gate businesses and how they financed and, and those kind of things. And Holly Petraeus, the wife of General Petraeus, she was also the head of the military division of the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. And she testified before Congress and said that researchers had gone out and looked at the counties and zip codes that had the highest concentration of payday lenders. And what they found, they all had one thing in common, they were close to large military populations. And the researchers went on to describe this environment where service members were literally surrounded by companies that were willing to finance things and charge an annual rate average, average of 450%. You know, some were a lot higher than that. That was just the average. And so what that led to was the Military Lending Act of 2007. It was signed into law in 06, went into effect in 07. And basically what it did was two things. It provided some protections for service members, the biggest one being the prohibition against mandatory allotments, but it also capped interest rates on 36, at 36%, but only for certain products. And those products were three types of loans. You had payday loans, auto title loans, and refund anticipation loans. Why did it really cover those three? Well, according to the National Foundation for Credit Counseling, 60% of service member families have borrowed money from non-traditional um, ways uh, of borrowing. I don't know a better way to say that. And those were the three. Uh, but it had some stipulations to it. For the payday loans, if it was more than $2,000 or longer than 90 days, the MLA didn't apply. If it was an auto title loan, if it was longer than six months, it didn't apply. Some pretty big loopholes. Interesting backstory to this is Congress, who normally writes laws, actually went to DOD and said, we want you to write this. Well, why did DOD write something that only uh, provided for three types of loans and then had loopholes in it? I, I can't answer about the loopholes. I can't answer about uh, the three things. The FDIC has said that service members are underserved uh, when it comes to banking. And so there was a concern that you can have the unintended consequences of tightening up the rules so much that now young service members don't have any place they can go. So they went after the, the three that they saw as the biggest problem areas, but they left those loopholes in there. And what happened was that it resulted in things like this. The spouse of a wounded warrior in the Illinois National Guard takes out a loan for $2,500. Her annual percentage rate is 300%. A little bit better than the 450, but I wouldn't call it good, right? So she ends up paying over 5,000 in interest, lands up paying over $8,000 for a $2,500 loan. And the Military Lending Act did not apply. Why? Because it went longer than six months. You've got a Travis Air Force Base Airman, and you know, we like to say airmen are a little bit smarter, right? He did a lot better than 300%. He got a 100% interest rate, 102% interest rate. He took out a loan for $6,000. He paid over $7,000 in interest. And again, the Military Lending Act did not apply. Why? Because it went longer than six months. So we went back. We re-looked re at this, and they updated it in 2015. It went into effect in October 2016, about two and a half years ago. So this is still relatively new. The first thing they did was they closed those loopholes. The second thing they did was they said this should apply to more things than just those payday loans, auto title loans, and refund anticipation loans. So now it also applies to credit cards, credit union loans, installment loans, bank overdraft loans. So really, most of the financial products that are out there are now covered by the Military Lending Act. The other thing it did, it established what's called the uh, Military Annual Percentage Rate, the MAPR, a term that, had, as far as I know, hadn't really been used before. The reason they did this is so let's say I'm a lender who's out in town and Chief here comes to borrow money and she gets a loan and let, it's, just, it's below the 36% cap. Well, while we're signing papers, I say, wouldn't you like to have some credit insurance? You know, just in case there's an emergency and something happens and you can't pay, it'll go ahead and pay it. And she says, you know, that sounds really good. So I add on that debt protection. Well, that, I, don't have to, I don't have to comply with 36% for that. 
So I loan her the money at 36%, but I add on the ancillary product of debt protection and I charge her 900% for that. Okay, so they came back and said, look, if you're gonna loan money to the military, it, whatever ancillary products you wanna add into it, it's still got to come under that 36% rate. So it also added some more prohibitions. Um, it, it prohibited rolling over a loan that had a balance to a bigger loan because it just continues that cycle of debt and it gets bigger and bigger because they're rolling over an old, old balance into a new balance. It also prohibited mandatory arbitration. And I like this one, it's interesting. Why? Because most of you know an example of this. Uh, the Samsung Galaxy phones, they had the problem where they, a few years ago they were exploding, right? Well, there, and it's, to the best of my knowledge, last year it was still going on in court. Why? because they brought a class action lawsuit and Samsung is arguing that in its terms of use, you know the terms of use that you click on after you read every single word in it? In that terms of, uh, uh, of use it said, look, if there's a dispute, you agree to arbitration. Well, what's the problem with that? The arbitrator uh, is almost always paid for by who? The lending organization. So where do you think they usually land when they make a decision? So they prohibited mandatory arbitration. The, the next one I think is kind of funny, but it's, it, it had to be done. They would re, some lending institutions would require you to provide a signed blank check when you got the loan. So if you didn't make a payment, they could just fill it out and, and, and go ahead and cash it themselves. And, and a lot of places did that, not your reputable places. And then they got rid of prepayment penalties, and that's important because for a lot of these companies, they were charging 450% average. Now they can only charge 36%. They did not want you to pay off early. So they would add a hefty prepayment penalty. So if you walked in and said, I, I got to get out of debt, here's the money, they go, oh, well, you owe me X amount because you paid off early. That way they could get as much money as possible. So those are all covered in the Military Lending Act. Let me ask you something. Show hands. I want to see it from everybody. How many of you have he had heard of the Military Lending Act before today? Uh, that's really not too bad. Better than I expected. Good job. All right, so now we're going to spend some time talking here. I'm going to hand this to you, because I'm, and, but you can't forget that I gave it to you, okay? All right. No, no, I don't want you to click. I just want you to hold it, because I, I want my hands free. I've got to talk. All right, so considerations for leaders. The first thing is we don't recruit bad credit. Bad credit is a disqualifying factor. Now, if you have some minor things, maybe there's a waiver, but bad credit is disqualifying. We do take in folks who have debt, like student debt, and I think I had read somewhere, and you guys have seen this, where the average enlistee now, or the enlistees come in with an average of over $20,000 in debt. Man, I couldn't get anybody to give me credit when I was 18 years old, much less have $20,000 in debt, but that comes in. We also have folks who have shallow credit, which is what I was when I first joined, which is you just don't have very much. You know, you, you may have one or two little things, but there's not enough to really give a good view of your credit report. So, if we don't recruit bad credit, where is it that they really go wrong? And I would argue that it's in the first three to six months after they get out of basic. Because, I mean, let, let's think back. These folks are what, typically 18, 19 years old. It is typically their first real job, and it's a good job, and it pays well, and it's got good benefits, and it's secure. They know they're going to be doing this job for the next three to four to six years, hopefully, unless something bad happens, right? Um, businesses know that too, and there's nothing predatory about that. Businesses want to do business with a young military person. Why? Because it's a good job. It's secure. Military people pay their debts. So this young 18 or 19 year old airman, they get to their first duty station, maybe even before that, what are some of the things they start to buy? They got to buy a car, got to have a nice car. Maybe it doesn't have to be a Corvette, but you want a nice car that your friends will think will cool and maybe help you get a date, right? And you need to have a stereo in that car that can be heard in the next state. Um, what about the dorm room? What do you need in there? You got to have a TV, not just any TV. You got to have an 80 inch TV because you got to be able to see it from across, your, across the room, right? What about a gaming system? Maybe two gaming systems because you've got, 
you know, Sega and you got PlayStation. I, those may, well, those may be the same thing. I have no idea why that was funny, but okay. Um, but you've got to have a laptop. You've got to have a smartphone. You've got to have all these things. Now, <clears throat> I'm not knock knocking those purchases. The next time you go to a chief's group meeting, I want you to look in the parking lot. See how many $50,000, $60,000 BMWs, Mercedes, F-250s with roll bars and fog lights that will never see off-road because they're too nice. <laughs> but again, I'm not knocking the purchases. The point that I'm trying to make is everybody wants their bling. But hopefully by the time you're, well, I started to say before you're our age, but that would be a disservice to you. By the time you're a chief, You've learned how to buy things smartly. You either learn through hard knocks or somebody taught you a little bit uh, of how to buy things wisely, right? So, for argument's sake, if we don't recruit bad credit and we know that it's in that first three to six months that they get into debt above their head, there is a window of opportunity there for us to engage. Now, it is a tough window because sometimes they come to us at their first duty station out of tech school already badly in debt, right? but there is a window of opportunity. Now what we do, we tend to do, is we set no expectations for them. You know, I had a friend of mine, he was a command chief out at PACAF, some of you may remember him, Chief Tony Bishop, used to say, if you set the bar so low that a dead man can get across it, why are you surprised with mediocre and, and uh, substandard results? But we don't set expectations for finances. We do for fitness, we do for education, we don't for finance. The reason I mention those three things, if you go out and do the research, people who have an education, people who are healthy, and people who have their finances in order live longer. And so we don't pay. There are a lot of tools that are available out there now, much more than when I was a young uh, service member, but it's kind of like having a parade that nobody comes to. It's like having uh, a, the greatest web page in the world that nobody uses. There's got to be a delivery uh, method in that. And we set no expectations is an expectation, is it not? Okay. So go with me here for just a minute. I want to give a couple of examples of differing expectations. One is on the officer side, one is on the enlisted side. I don't mean to make it sound us versus them. It's not. It's just a very good illustration. So for our young men and women that go to the service academies, when they are in their junior year, there are two large financial institutions that do a lot of business with the military that offer what is called a career starter loan. The name career starter loan even implies that there's expectations. This is to help you get started in your career. So when you're a junior at one of the service academies, you can take out a $36,000 unsecured personal loan and pay 0.75% interest. Not 7.5, 0.75. Now, why would a business do that? Well, obviously, the same reasons they want to do business with the military. It's a great job. They know you're going to be in it for a while. You're, you're looking to make this a career. But more importantly, they have a discussion with you that says, look, with a personal loan of 36000 at 0.75% interest, if you take that money and invest it with us, you'll earn more in interest than you're having to pay. If you add to that X amount over 20 years, this is what you'll walk out with at 20 years, at 22 years. So there is automatically this expectation that not only will you be financially sound, but that you will build wealth throughout a career. Now, on the enlisted side, and I understand this, there's a lot of tools available now, and I'm going back 37, 38 years to when I came in, I had formal and informal financial education, and I, I think you guys will, will find this interesting, maybe humorous. My formal education was a correspondence course that was focused on how to balance a checkbook. Now, when I came in, there wasn't, you didn't even have to have direct deposit, there weren't ATMs, there weren't debit cards, that kind of thing. So everything was done by check, right? So how to balance your checkbook, man, that, that's it. Now, my informal financial education, when I got to my first duty station, somebody actually did, one of my staff NCOs, I started in the Marine Corps, grabbed me and said, look, let me give you a little financial education. I said, do not ever write a bad check and land up in the first sergeant's office. Because, you know, some of you may remember back in the day, if you got into trouble with that stuff, it went to your chain of command, right? So do not write a bad check. Now, my corporals, 
they were even better. They gave me some informal education. They pulled me to the side and said, hey, man, we got the secret to this. Don't get a checking account. I said, well, why not? I said, well, if you don't have a checking account, can't write a bad check. Can't write a bad check, can't get in trouble. <laughs> Made perfect sense to me. So I would take my check over to the PX. I would cash it, get my cash, and then I would live life for the next two weeks. I'm 18 years old. I got friends who want to do stuff. I don't have a car. We would go out, and I would spend my money, and I would run out of money before payday. So... Thank God for those corporals, because they really had my back. They would loan me $20 whenever I needed it. But I had to pay them back 40 on payday. So what is that but a 100% payday loan? Is it not? I didn't have to worry about the predatory lenders outside the gate. They lived in the barracks with me. <laughs> and I never understood why Corporal Brown said, hey, now, if anybody asks, don't say anything about this. Because I thought he was doing me a favor. And I'm not dogging him now because I was the consumer. I wanted it. I thought it was a great deal. Give me 20 bucks and, and I can go to the club for the next two nights. But I got into a cycle of debt where, with my own corporals, where half my paycheck was going to my corporals. It all comes back to expectations that you set, whether it's to build wealth in a career or whether it's don't you dare get in trouble. There's a huge difference. Every time I do one of these classes, someone will come up afterwards and go, man, when I was young, somebody pulled me to the side, got me saving, and I did that for the rest of my career, now I'm set. That's what we have to do. As a chief, maybe you don't sit down with every person, but you can make that an area of emphasis because go back to the fact that it is mission-related. It is the second leading contributing cause for service member suicide. It is the number one reason that service members lose their security clearance. The other thing that we do we set no expectations, and then we tend to blame the member. What I mean by that is not that we, you tell them it's all their fault, but we tend to discount or look down on the things that they buy. You don't need that. that God, why do they spend money on that? That's stupid. Well, remember, we all want our bling. Greatest example, I can remember this as a young first sergeant. I remember at a first sergeant council meeting, our, we had a big discussion about spinner rims. Remember spinner rims? Yeah, I'm old enough now to swear some of you had them. And, uh, but, th you know, spending $2,000 on rims for a $200 car. That, you know, we, we were dogging them for what they bought, but yet we're driving a BMW. My point here, it's not on what they buy, it's how they buy it. Does that make sense? I looked at a contract several years ago for a young, young Army E3 who had bought an iPhone 5. That'll tell you about how long ago it was. And at the time, it was probably a $450 or $500 phone, right? By the time he finished his financing it, it was going to cost him $2,300. You know, I do believe our young service members do pay attention to their money on a monthly basis. They don't necessarily look at what it's going to cost them in the long run. What I tend to try to do when I sit down with a young person is go, look, I know you want your bling. You can either have your bling and be broke, or we can sit down and talk about how to have your bling and have some money left over. Then you can decide if you want to invest that or if you just have money left over for the weekend. Instead of buying that iPhone 5 and financing it uh, and paying four times, let's go out on the Apple website and let's look what a uh, refurbished last generation iPhone costs. Because you may not have to finance that, and then that's a monthly payment you don't have to worry about. Again, it's teaching people how to buy things smartly. And that kind of leads right into the next bullet of our financial education often misses the mark. And not to say that it's not good, but we have, you know, really good briefings. Most of you have probably had it. I know I had it at least three times in my career. Um, how to make a million dollars in a career in the military, right? But the hard, fast truth, the one solid rule that will never fail in investing, never fail. You cannot invest what you do not have. And so I can talk to you all day long about investing, but if you're broke and not knowing how you're going to get to next payday and you're having to think about borrowing money from your corporals like I did, boy, that's going to sail right over your head. Even if you are thinking about retirement long term, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, my daughter is in her 30s now and she's a, a financial advisor and she's really got it together with her money. Uh, and when she was young, I talked to her a lot about money and the fact that money can't buy you happiness, but it'll darn sure lower your stress. Be smart with it. And uh, she got engaged, and her, her fiancé went off uh, to basic. Before he went to basic, 
I said, boy, you got to enroll in TSP. Just do it. He came back from basic, said, did you enroll in TSP? No, nah, but I'll get it. I'll hit it when I go to tech school. So he goes to tech school. Comes back, said, did you enroll in TSP? He says, no, nah, but I'll get it in my first duty station. The dent in my forehead is getting stronger because I'm beating on this kid. You need to enroll in TSP. Finally, my daughter calls me and she goes, dad, lay off. We enrolled in TSP. I said, all right, good deal. February rolls around and she calls me and, and says, hey, we got our TSP statement. We got this much in there. Next year, February rolls around, she calls me, and now she's excited. She goes, Dad, you won't believe how much we have in TSP. This is great. But I'm paying attention because, you know, we're friends on Facebook, and I'm seeing things, as many of you parents do, you may see some things that concern you. The thing that I saw was a two-door red Mercedes-Benz coupe. And I called her, and I said, how could you afford this? And she goes, Dad, don't worry about it. You raised me right. It's three years old. We got a good deal on it. It still has warranty. It's low miles. And we can afford this. I actually got off the phone going, that's my baby girl, you know. And, uh, but then over the next few months, they bought a Chevy Avalanche and a couple other things. And I'm starting to go, oh. And then I see a four-wheeler, you know, recreational four-wheeler. And so I immediately got on the, got on the computer and, and pulled up the pay chart just to make sure that E3s hadn't gotten some huge pay raise that I didn't know about. <laughs> and I called her and said, hey. You know, there, there's no way, I, you know, because I know what you guys make. And, uh, and after a while, she tells me, well, we got in a little bit, you know, over our head, a little bit. But you taught me to always, you know, have, you know, to borrow from yourself. And, uh, and so what we did was we took a loan out against our TSP. And you know what? That's not necessarily a bad thing. But I told her, I said, honey, you realize that you're losing interest twice now. You're losing the interest you would have earned on the money that would have been in there. And you're also having to pay interest on, on the money that you borrowed, which was your money to begin with. And again, that just makes the point that you need to have an emergency fund. You need to have money put away that you can touch on your own. And so, uh, again, with our financial education, well, and I, the, the moral of that story is it really hit me that you can't teach somebody to be smart with their money until you teach them how not to be stupid with it. And that may sound harsh, but go back to, you can't invest what you don't have, right? So how much good does it have to talk with somebody about retirement when you really need to be talking to them about how to just purchase something without overpaying? Uh, and then the last one, nothing is more vital than NCO engagement. I would use myself and my daughter as an example. But I go back to, to my early days when I owed all my money to my corporals. And I finally decided, hey, I'm in a cycle of debt here. I've got to get out of this. And so I was paying them back. I wasn't borrowing any money. And Corporal Brown, my primary lender, my preferred lender, uh, came to me and said, man, I hadn't seen you. What's going on? I said, man, I'm trying to save to get a car. I need to get a car. It takes 40 minutes to get off Camp Pendleton. And my gunnery sergeant that I worked for heard the end of that conversation. And later on in that day, he goes, hey, Usri, come here. I said, yeah, Gunny, what do you need? He goes, I heard you talking to Corporal Brown and said you were going to buy a car. I said, yeah, that's, that's what I was talking about. Gunny said, well, when are you going to buy a car? I don't know for sure. I've got to save up a little bit of money. He goes, well, before you go out and buy a car, come see me. We'll jump in my truck and ride out there. I know a couple of places that are reputable, won't rip you off. I'll make sure you get a good deal. I cannot overemphasize the impact of that three-minute conversation because here is what was really going to happen. I was going to save out up, up, up about $200. I was going to go get on the bus with my $200 in my hand, and I was going to spend 30 minutes or 40 minutes riding off base. When I got off base in Oceanside, California, I was going to get off that bus. I don't have a car, so what am I going to do? I'm going to look around for what? The first car lot I find. And I'm 18, 19 years old. I'm going to go there, and I'm going to pretend I know what I'm doing. I'm going to kick the tires. I'm going to look at the engine like I actually know how it operates. And then I was going to make a deal for a car that I liked. And, and I undoubtedly would have overpaid both in the short term and the long term. But because of a three-minute conversation, I went back to the barracks saying, yeah, the gunny's got my back. He's going to take me out make sure I don't get ripped off. I mean, that's all it takes is a three-minute conversation that says, hey, before you do anything, come talk to me, man. I'll help you out. And they see that their NCOs are on their side. So again, the power of NCO engagement, I think, is probably one of the biggest messages in this presentation. And you've got my clicker. All right, I'm done with that slide. So now, some other things to know. 
<clears throat> and I, try, I do try to pick things that maybe aren't, you know, the run of the mill that, that you, you've heard about before. I know you all have heard about debt to income ratio. How much debt do you have compared to your income? The reason I put the 40% in there, because that's generally the line somewhat drawn in the sand uh, by lending institutions where they will not lend to you anymore. 43% uh, for mortgages, about 40% for regular personal loans, that kind of thing. Banks start to back away from you. So it doesn't matter that you have paid everything on time. I want you to go back and I want you to think about our young airmen that went and bought the TV, the laptop, the two gaming systems, the car, all those things. Their debt to income ratio now is 70 to 85%. Now if they want to get a loan to consolidate it, they can't get one from a traditional bank usually. They have slipped from the prime market to the subprime market. Most of you probably in general understand what prime and subprime means. The reason I put it on there is there is no line in the sand for credit score that drops you to subprime, but generally speaking, it's about 650. Most banks will start backing away from you if your credit score is below 680. And so it, do, and it doesn't matter, again, if you made all the payments in time, if your debt to income ratio is completely out of whack. And so I'm gonna skip a bullet here and go to the credit reports. You all know that you can pull a credit report from each of the three major credit reporting agencies annually. There's two things I wanna share with you on this. First of all, we normally only do this when, when there's an issue, right? What I would recommend that you do is you set it up to where every four months you pull one report from one of these agencies. So you're seeing your full uh, disclosed credit report every four months. The other thing I would tell you, a lot of you in here pay a few dollars a month for uh, credit monitoring through your bank. Okay, so there was a law, and I wish I could remember the name of it, that was signed last year, it goes into effect, and as of May this year, the three major credit reporting agencies <clears throat> must provide active duty military to include Active Guard and Reserve a free credit monitoring. So come May, you can contact them. You just have to show that you're active duty, and then you will get free credit report monitoring. The other thing that I recommend is something where you can kind of keep an eye on it every day. It costs nothing is these two apps, and I know there's other like it. I use these. I'm not recommending them, but I am saying that I use them. Experian gives you a good view of your Experian credit report, and Credit Karma covers Equifax and TransUnion. And I've actually had an instance where an on-post credit union did something to my credit report that dropped the score by 100 points. I knew it immediately because of the Credit Karma app. I went to that institution and said, this is wrong, you need to fix this. And they said, no, we're not gonna fix it. I went back to them, said, this is why you need to fix it. They said, no, you need to fix it. And I went back to them again and they said, well, if you'll pay this and this and this, we'll put a note on your credit report. And so I went to the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau down at the bottom um, and filed a complaint. And within two weeks, I had a letter from the vice president of the bank saying, sorry, we fixed your credit. So I know I'm jumping around here a little bit, but the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, hopefully most of you have heard about that. Um, one of the things they have on their website that I highly recommend is they have a complaint database. So if you're getting ready to take out a loan with somebody, you can go in there and you can type in the name of that company and you can see all the complaints that have been filed against them. There were 19,000 complaints filed last year. So you go in and type in whatever it is and you see what kind of complaints they are. Uh, it gives you an idea of whether you're dealing with somebody that's reputable or not. Going back to credit score and debt to income ratio, when you get to that point that you can't use a traditional bank uh, to take out a loan, then you get pushed down to using things like finance companies. I don't have anything against finance companies, but there's something you need to know about finance company versus banks. Banks are federally regulated by both, both the OCC, the Office of Comptroller and Currency, and the CFPB. Those two federal organizations proactively come out and go through your books on a regular basis. Why? So that consumers feel a level of security with the banking institutions that they do business with. Finance companies are regulated primarily at the state level. And many states only inspect finance companies in a reactive measure, when there's been a problem, when there's been complaints. So obviously, anytime you want to borrow money, you want to try to do it uh, through, through a bank. 
Um, let's see. Oh, and the last thing, which seems to be pretty popular, that 1885 opt-out. You all have heard about the, uh, uh, the National Do Not Call Registry. This is the National Do Not Send Me Credit junk. Uh, and so you can either go to that website or you can go to that phone number, and that will stop all the free credit offers that, that you get in the mail. All right. A couple of examples. I know the principles of this you understand, but it, I think it always helps to put it on a screen. Person A on the left is in prime credit. They have a 730 credit score. Person B is in subprime. They have a 599. They both go to the same car lot, the same salesman. They both buy a 2016 Toyota Camry with the same term. Look at the difference in interest rates. Basically 2% versus 15%. And in the long term, that works out to a total of $10,000 more to pay for the exact same car. The next one is, is uh, same type of thing, but for revolving credit versus installment credit. And the reason I put this on there is, you know, almost all of us when we were young had credit card debt. Uh, when I sit down and talk with young people about saving and those kind of things, one of the first things they always say is, I'm going to start as soon as I pay off these credit cards. We, we pay for something on a credit card and we have every intention of doing what? Paying it off quickly. And then it hangs around for a year or two or three till we finally get fed up and say, I can't deal with this anymore, I got my tax return, I'm gonna pay it off. But both of those are for the same amount, $3,000. The installment loan actually has a higher percentage rate, but the, the, total that you're going, or the total time that you're gonna pay is two years versus up to 10 years, and you save about $1,000 in interest. Sometimes it's just smarter to go out and say, hey, I'm gonna take out a personal loan for a year, year and a half, two years, than running the risk of, of putting it on a credit card and carrying that forward. Quite honestly, I, I have a business credit card and I probably put somewhere between seventy dollars to $100,000 a year on that, but it is paid off every single month uh, with business expenses. All right, basic tips for budgeting. I know you know some of this, but I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this stuff for a reason. And you can find stuff similar to this out on the internet pretty easy. A lot of places recommend that you track your spending for a week or two weeks. I recommend 30 days because doing it for a full month gives you a good view of what you've spent over the entire month. What do you think the biggest surprise for married couples when they sit down and they track it for a month and go back and look at what they spent? What do you think the biggest surprise is? Eating out, absolutely. Chunk of change on eating out. That's probably the easiest thing to cut back on. But there's other things that you, can, that you can work with and lower those payments. So after you've done it for 30 days, you sit down and you really analyze where your money's going. Do it, you know, if you've got a significant other or spouse, you do it with them, you go over it and you start to make those cuts. Okay, we're going to eat out once a week, but also, you know, I'm going to look at, should I refinance my car with another location where the payment will be cheaper? I'm going to look at my cable bill. I'll give you a personal example of this. I hate my cable bill. I absolutely hate it. And, uh, and to get a package that has the channels you want, you have to get more channels than you need. And I'm trying to get that cost down, and I'm talking to the cable guy, and I got the dent in the middle of my forehead. And uh, he says, well, you've got HBO. What do you watch on HBO? I said, Game of Thrones. He said, well, you got Showtime. What do you watch on Showtime? Watch Ray Donovan. He said, well, you know those are a la carte, right? I said, what are you getting at? He says, you don't have to sign a contract for those. You can turn those on and off anytime you want. So why, why do you have it if that's the only thing you're watching and you're paying for it all year around? So, you know, that's pretty smart. So I cut off Showtime, I cut off HBO. I, I'm not even gonna put Showtime back on there, but when Game of Thrones comes on next month, I'm gonna have me some Showtime, or some, some uh, HBO. Uh, but then start to have competitions with it. My wife and I, we used to, we'd get our groceries and we'd fill up the car uh, on, on Saturday or Sunday, and then that week we, could, we would see who could go without spending any cash. You can have competitions for who can go the longest, who can spend the least, and all of a sudden you start having money and you get better at it month to month. I'll tell you what I really recommend is that you do this for an entire year because you have uh, certain things that only come up once a year, right? The other thing on there that I skipped over is the don't use cash. Now, what I, I don't mean use credit cards. 
What I'm saying is when you go to the ATM and you take out 60 bucks, unless you're really good at saving receipts, we don't know where those, that 60 bucks went. Most of us have banking apps that if we use the debit card, as long as there's not a fee associated with that, we can pull up that banking app and we can see every little thing we spent. And so every day I would pull that up and I would see what we spent. Uh, a lot of them you can even go in and categorize it to where it'll start categorizing things for you automatically month to month. The whole purpose for this slide isn't to tell you the you know, three-level budgeting. It's to get to that last bullet. Develop an attitude of defending your money. You earned it. Why would you give it away? There was a marketing research firm, and I can't remember the name of it, but just recently they did some study, did some research on this, and came out and said, your average American sees up to 5,000 ads a day, is exposed to them. Now, that seems high to me, but I want you to think about this, whether it's on the radio, whether it's on social media, whether it's on TV, whether it's in a magazine, I don't care where it's at, every advertisement in the history of man has been de designed to do one thing, to separate you from your money. You earned it, why would you give it away without thinking about it? One of the tips I always give young folks is if it costs more than $100, sleep on it for at least a day. Walk away from it, sleep on it, because tomorrow you may realize you don't really need it all that much. So again, develop an attitude of defending your money. There's a difference between earning money and making money. Earning money is the amount that shows up on your LES. That's the amount I'm paying you for the work that you do. Making money is what you do with it after that point. Are you taking your money and putting it into things that will generate more income? Or are you simply taking the money that you earn and spending it? Because if you do, as an E9, you're no different than an E2. You just have bigger bills, right? Um, so take a look at this. Compounding interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it earns it. He who doesn't pays it. Absolutely brilliant quote. Einstein probably didn't say it. Snoke says it showed up about 20 years after he died. But I still like it, so I still use it. So... Um, what I want to do is I want to do a quick exercise with you as we start to wrap this up. Some of you may have seen this before. If you haven't, I think it's pretty powerful. So I'm going to come over here to First Sergeant Hansen. I'm going to give First Sergeant Hansen one penny. And then, how do you say your last name? Yeah, yeah, okay, so yeah, uh, Chief Yarborough. I'm going to give Chief Yarborough a million dollars. Now, I, if I asked you straight up who wants the penny, who wants the million dollars, of course, you'd want the million dollars, right? But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to double his penny every day for 31 days. I want to see a show of hands from everybody. Who wants the million dollars? Nobody. Oh, a couple people. What about the penny that's going to be doubled every day for 31 days? Show of hands. Okay, I said everybody show your hands. Come on, guys. Okay, so well, let, me, let me make the deal. Let, let, what was that show? Let's ma or make a deal or something like that? I'll make this two million. How many of you want the two million? How many of you want the penny? Okay, La and so many of you got your hands down, and I'm going to assume it's because you're so enthralled with this, you're forgetting to raise your hand, okay? <laughs> Final offer, three million. Three million, how many? For the penny, how many? All right, well, let's see how this thing goes. All right. So there's 10 days of this challenge. I'm going to double that penny every day. And at the end of 10 days, you don't quite have enough for a supersized extra value meal. You're close. Uh, you can get one of the $5 boxes from Kentucky Fried Chicken, but you don't have enough to pay the tax. Okay? Uh, so the important thing of this is we're one-third of the way through this exercise. One-third, and Chief Yarborough has a million dollars. First Sergeant Hansen has $5.12. We're one-third of the way through. Let's keep going. So now we're to day 20. We keep doing this every day. We keep doubling that penny. And on day 20, the First Sergeant has $5,200. Chief Yarborough still has a million. So with $5,200... I guess you can buy a fairly decent used car, but Yarborough's sitting over there with a million dollars still. So let's keep going with this. Through day 25, all right, first sergeant, you're starting to make some headway here. $167,000, that's a nice little nest egg, is it not? 
but it's not a million dollars, is it? Look how far through this challenge we are. We're 25 days through this challenge, and there's a difference of over 800,000. But now's where it starts to get interesting. Day 26, 300,000. Day 27, 600,000, almost 700. And then on day 28, bam, the first sergeant's finally in the money. He's got $1.3 million. Chief Yarborough's got a million. Both of them are very lucky, right? But 1.3 is better than one. But wait, there's more. Day 29, 2.6 million. Day 30, 5 million. Bam! <laughs> Almost $11 million. Now, the obvious lesson in this is what? The snowballing effect of compounding interest. You all know that. You're going, Chief, why are you telling me this? This is the real message I want to get across. On day 16, when you had about $350, if you went, oh man, the, the refrigerator broke down. I gotta take my money out of my investment and I gotta fix the refrigerator. I'm gonna pay this bill and then I'll start saving. Well, on day 31, when Chief Yarborough had a million, the first sergeant had 11 million, you've got $163.84 because you raided your investments. And that's an important message, I think. That's probably the more powerful message in this when you talk about the power of compounding interest and you say, yeah, chief, but you know, nobody doubles their money with this stuff. Well, you may be familiar with this, the rule of 72, take the number 72, divide it, blah, blah, blah. What it comes down to is if you earn 10% on your money, you will double it every 7.2 years. And I realize we don't probably make 10%, but over the life of the Dow Jones, it has never averaged less than 10% over the long term. So, all right. I am actually a little bit ahead of schedule, which is always a good thing for you. Now, come on. When you saw financial resiliency on your agenda, you kind of went, oh, boy. You know, but hey, I set high expectations. Did I give you guys stuff you maybe hadn't heard before? Maybe a little bit different perspective? All right, remember this is mission-related. Again, we've got to teach our service members to, to take care of their money because it does impact mission. You know, the, the second bullet on there is really one I use for the First Sergeant Academy, but it applies to all of us. We're supposed to provide that commander with a mission-ready enlisted force. You know, one thing I forgot to mention, and I will jump back here real quick. When I joined the Marine Corps, and first time I went overseas was 1984, if something happened back home, often by the time I found out about it, it had already been fixed because there wasn't social media, there wasn't cell phones. I had to go to a pay phone bank to call home. So really, things were fixed before I even found out about them. Is that the way things are today? Absolutely not. Our airmen deploy and they take all of that with them because they are, in most places they go to, connected. And so when they're having that conversation with home and, and the refrigerator is broken or the engine in the truck went out and you're an E2 or an E3, that creates a distraction that prevents them from focusing on the mission that you as chiefs need them to be focused on. Uh, again, I've mentioned it several times. The number one reason service members lose their security clearance, second contributing cause in service member suicide, but nothing, absolutely nothing, makes as big as an impact as an NCO who, I'm not kidding, takes three minutes and goes, hey, before you do that, come talk to me, I'll help you out. So. All right, folks, uh, I usually do the drop, mo drop mic and walk off stage, but anybody uh, have any questions, comments? You know, I realize that you are going to be in awe for the rest of the week, so I've agreed to stick around for the rest of this week. So I'll see you tonight at the social, and I'll be hanging out here all week. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.